time for some more people to show up. Does anybody have any questions uh, that I can answer even before I get started? <laughs> Ah, the D, yeah, the D65. In fact, let me go flip to a slide real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. The uh, D60 series is the new phones. Uh, you got a 60, which is like a 40 with two line buttons, a 62, uh, which I think is like the 65. Honestly, I'm not the expert on the. <laughs> it's a gigabit 60. There you go. So it's like the four, it's like the 45 that has the. Um, features of the D40, but has the gigabit, the, the uh, extra number. The D65 is like the D70 in that it has all the ex it has the six line buttons, but instead of being, um, instead of having the, the kind of a built-in sidecar, if you will, it has uh, the toggle buttons left and right uh, for the six line button, so you can flip between um, different contacts, so you can load multiple contacts into it. Yeah, it's got the page switch left and right buttons underneath the six line buttons. So the line but so what you you know like let's say you only have the one line button being used for a line, you can then page switch the con through your contacts if you got more than five loaded. Is there I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sure I'm I, I know somebody that does, and Mal Malcolm would be able to answer that question. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I'm the programmer they, you know, attach to DPMA to make them configured. <laughs> um, it, they are great, wonderful phones. They are more powerful in terms of having a, a higher horsepower. They have more features. There are certain features we've been able to do because of the higher CPU um, capability on the new phones that we weren't able to do on the old ones and will not. Uh, yes, and I have a slide on that. <laughs> You're very welcome. All right. I th think we probably have everybody that we're going to have, and it is 4.02. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, let me push some buttons here. Start new. OK, if, uh, let's see if I can get this to show up. If anybody wants to join in a Google hosted questions mechanism, I've got a link here. Uh, Google slides M U S I'm sorry, M U Z X seven nine. G-O-O dot G L slash slides slash M U Z X seventy nine. This is my first time using the Google slide. Oh, it's actually up there in the top. Well, what do you know? Aren't they smart? Oh, no, really? All right, we'll forget about it then. That's annoying. Apparently, we're, we're not able to share that today. All right, well, forget that. I still can bring up my, my notes. All right, so let's get started. Uh, if you are in the wrong place, my apologies, but we're going to talk about deploying uh, Digium phones with DPMA. Um, I'm hosting this. Um, that's my name. It's uh, long and German. Um, if you look at the odd spelling of that, and then you think about the cute little pre-PBX mascot guy, the green tree frog, and then try to say green pen frog, you've got it. <laughs> It's one of the little tricks my uh, wife uses with her kindergartners. Um, I've got a Twitter, I've got an email, but uh, uh, really we're here to talk about DPMA, not so much me. A um, few notes about me. I joined Digium in uh, September of 2013, so I've actually been with Digium for three years uh, as of the start of this month. Uh, I originally started on the Asterix team, uh, and they very quickly got me um, uh, I mean, I think they really, you know, did tag me originally to be working on uh, the free PBX and the DPMA components uh, because of some of my prior experience with configuring phones, as well as a uh, tolerance of PHP um, that uh, must have, most of the rest of the team does not have. 
So um, uh, overview uh, real quick, what we're going to talk about, uh, DPMA, how does it work, a whole bunch of detailed information. Suffice it to say that I'm going to go through a lot of, um, you know, because I'm an engineer, I got to get all the details right. Um, I'm going to get through a lot of detailed information. Uh, I will be doing a demonstration uh, as soon as I get through my slides. Uh, so if you um, are um, not understanding some of the technical details, uh, hold up to the end. We will have some question and answer time, probably quite a bit of it. I've got an hour in this room, um, and I shouldn't have even a half hour worth of slides and demo. So uh, plenty of time to talk about whatever you'd like to uh, learn on DPMA. Uh, but basically going through uh, the really important stuff as I've been uh, working on the code. I did not originally create the DPMA or the Digium Phones modules. Those were done by people before me. Uh, I am, however, now the uh, maintainer, if you will, uh, and the guy putting uh, forward uh, um, new code for it. So, uh, I skipped the slide, didn't I? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, what is DPMA? Um, actually, if you put DPMA into Google, the first slide that you'll come up with, I mean, the first hit that you'll come up with is the German Patent Agency. The German Patent Office is actually dpma.de. Um, somewhere way down the list, maybe you'll come up with a Digium Phone module for Asterix, which is uh, where we get the acronym D DPMA. It is the module uh, responsible for configuring all of our phones as easily as possible, borrowing as much information from what you've already put in Asterix, adding a little bit of extra information so we know what we're configuring to what phone, and then maintaining the state information about what phone has been configured, what MAC address has been given, what extension, uh, and doing it in a secure way. So how does it work? Uh, you have to load this Residigium phone.so module into Asterix in order to enable the extra functionality. Uh, it is a compiled module, uh, commercially licensed module. The source code is not available for this component. Uh, but we do provide a free license code. Uh, once you have that loaded, you need to um, uh, configure the free license code, and we'll go over that a little bit. And you need to uh, put the configuration information uh, that you need to describe the phones that you wish to configure through uh, DPMA uh, into a resdigiumphone.com. Now, this is a standard asterisk configuration file format. If you've ever seen, you know, brackets, name, value, uh, na you know, a variable name equals value, uh, if you've seen that before, it's the same thing. So uh, basically, the same format that we're already comfortable with, it's just yet another asterisk configuration file to go put a few things in to get it to do what you want right. Uh, the process is that the phone will find the asterisk server through MDNS. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Uh, the phone uh, then is, presents on its screen a list of extensions that it has found on the server. And you can then select one of the phones I'm sorry, select one of the extensions, and the phone will then pull that configuration, reboot if necessary, and uh, at any point later, you can make changes on the server, and that phone will be uh, reloaded uh, once you've hit the command or button um, in order to tell it to actually go and load that new configuration. So it, once you've gotten the phone initially started up, you can change the configuration at any time on the server without having to touch the phone. So a little bit of a pictorial diagram. How does it work? Well, you got your license file has to get loaded into DPMA when it starts. You have the configuration file, which you have on your terminal edited up and put into the Etsy asterisk directory with all the rest of the configuration files. DPMA talks to the phone through either SIP or PJSIP. We support both ChanSIP and ChanPJSIP. Uh, whichever one the phone is using uh, is what we'll be talking to the phone and configuring it through. Uh, an example of this configuration file I'm talking about, I'm sure this looks very familiar. You've got uh, general section that provides some inf details on 
this instance of res, I mean, this instance of Asterix, the, the residigium foam configuration itself, including the fact that we've got a, a pin code to secure the system, what we're calling our server, um, what it shows up on the phone as. Uh, we have to put in some address, some IP addressing and port information in order to make sure that um, the phone knows how to contact back to the server, since there is the possibility uh, under certain network, network situations, you could be contacting it through a NAT. So all those uh, values are exposed so that you can get them right. Of course, one of the tricks is if you've changed the server on your IP and you're wondering why your DPMA works, uh, go hunt your Resdigium phone comp and find all the instances of your old IP and change it to the new one. Um, I've run into that myself more than once. On the left side, we also have a configuration for the network. This is a, a bare minimum configuration we have here to get one phone up and running. Uh, a configuration for a line, and it's basically just a placeholder entry to say, hey, there is a, a 200 extension system, in, I mean, a 200 um, endpoint, uh, an extension in SIP or PJSIP with the uh, endpoint identifier of 200. Go get the rest of the configuration, the password, from that entry elsewhere in Asterix. It'll do that automatically. And then some description for the uh, individual settings that I want on this specific phone. Uh, DPMA with free PBX. It actually is much the same. DPMA itself underneath free PBX operates the same way that it does with just pure Asterix. The difference being that the um, in the free PBX model, there is an additional module, uh, the PHP module called Digium Phones, uh, not to be confused with the Res Digium Phone uh, Asterix module. The Digium Phones module is in the free PBX architecture. It is open source, it is written in PHP, um, and it is responsible for providing now a web interface instead of just a text file interface. Uh, that makes it easier to configure the phones. Uh, it's stored temporarily in MySQL. When you hit that red apply button that we're all familiar with, if you've ever used free PBX, that resdigionphone.conf file is updated, and then the phones get those uh, updates through the um, DPMA module and through the Chan SIP or Chan PJ SIP driver. Um, obviously, I maintain uh, for Digium both modules, the, Dig the Resdigium phone module and the Digium phones PHP module that goes inside free PBX. All right, how are the phones configured? Now, what I want to do here is compare and contrast a little bit about what makes DPMA unique. Why is it that DPMA exists and why is it that it is so different from every other way that you might auto configure a phone? Conventional provisioning for a, an IP phone usually uses TFTP, maybe FTP, HTTP, HTTPS, some manner of transport to allow the phone to download the configuration file, and to tell the phone where the server is, option 66 in DHCP. Very conventional. Um, I mean, if, if I grab a Polycom, Yealink, uh, even Cisco phones, uh, anything, and I've got a DHCP server with an option 66 saying, here's my server IP address. The phone will go to that server and using whichever protocol it prefers or which one protocol I've told it, if it supports that, will go and download some file. Now, usually this is, you know, whatever the MAC address of the phone is, .cfg. Or in the case of a Cisco phone, it'll be SEP in the MAC address, .xml or something, or I, I've forgotten now. But basically, you have to know what the MAC address is of the phone so that you can put that file in the TFTP or the HTTP server with all of the configuration information you need for that phone. Now, that's fine if you already have the phones up and running. You just you know, go ahead and make a quick change to the phones or regenerate them through some protocol. But if you are going to bootstrap 100 phones in a new building, all out of the box, scratch from new. You're now gonna go through and barcode scan or whatever, all those MAC addresses to load them in and then get those files pre-built so that when the phone comes along later asking for it, you've got that file. 
Um, now, a Digium phone will actually support this. Uh, it will support being configured without using the DPMA method. It will support option 66 for discovery. It does not support TFTP, but it does support all the other protocols. And it uses the same Polycom style uh, MAC address dot CFG. So a 12 digit hexadecimal MAC address dot CFG is what it will ask for. Um, and actually that might be wrong, that might be XML, my apologies. Um, but it's the same format. Then the Digium phones with DPMA, the huge difference here is that for discovery, uh, we predominantly use MDNS. Now this is um, a multicast DNS. I'll explain what that is in a minute. We use SIP message to transfer the configuration. Uh, as an alternative, say that you're in a scenario that is not supporting multicast, you can use option 66 for discovery, and what you're gonna do is send it a special URL saying, go get your configuration from SIP, proxy at the server, and whatever the port is. So MDNS, uh, for anybody that doesn't already know, MDNS is another name for Avahai, which is another name for Bonjour, which is a protocol that Apple came up with to make it possible to discover nearby computers and servers, services, because they can self-publish a DNS record on a multicast address. It's basically like a broadcast with, with similar to the way that broadcasts work, a limited range, but multicast generally will be passed by uh, routers if configured to do so. Um, DPMA uses MDNS to announce what the server is to any phone in the vicinity. Uh, it also uses a special record type, uh, Digium Proxy, to prevent any confusion with any other MDNS service. Uh, it is possible to see that if you pull up an MDNS browser um, so you can see what's being published. Uh, okay, what is SIP message? So we use MDNS for discovery, but I'm talking about using SIP message for transferring the information to the phone rather than FTP or HTTP or TFTP. Uh, now, SIP message has to be one of the worst named methods in SIP because, okay, it's like, well, you know, it's very confusing. You could say, all right, um, I've got a message that's in SIP, and rather than it being an invite or a register, a SIP message is basically a SIP message with a method of message, capital M-E-S-S-A-G-E, -S um, i.e. it's a SIP message message, if that's not confusing enough. <laughs> uh, I really, rather bothersome name, but unfortunately for, I mean, fortunately for DPMA, um, the SIP message, it is um, available for us to use because it's not really being used for anything else. Uh, it's a way of sending a textual message from server to phone, phone to server, and it's done outside of a call. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's similar to sending an SMS message, um, uh, and, but it's not commonly used by the phone otherwise. There's not a whole lot of, of use on, uh, for desk phones for this. So basically what we're using is something that exists in SIP as a protocol, um, and we are putting the DPMA messaging on top of the SIP message tra as, a, as a transport. Uh, so we're using SIP message to allow the phone to make that request to DPMA after it's discovered where it is and request a configuration file. All right, uh, so, okay, yeah, we're using SIP. <laughs> we really are. Uh, it sounds strange, but um, because Asterix is already configured to allow phones to talk to it on SIP, this transport already exists. This pathway already exists. Um, now, it's important that DPMA is configured for the same port and transport that you're using for your SIP register from the phone. Uh, any port can be used instead of port 5060. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to put all the phones on 5070 or something, uh, that's not a problem. Um, TCP and TLS are now available to be used 
uh, starting with DPMA 3.2. Uh, 320 DPMA was released uh, this week, this last week, actually. Uh, SIP register uh, is normally used to establish a connection between the phone and Asterix. And you can't necessarily call, send a call to the phone because you don't know where it is until the SIP register has happened. That is not true of SIP message. SIP message is a separate parallel communications path. Yes, it comes from the same place, but DPMA tracks what that URI is uh, in a, separately. It keeps track of that so that it's possible for the phone to get in touch with Asterix before the SIP register has happened because, of course, the phone being completely empty on a first out-of-box experience uh, doesn't yet have the user account to send a SIP register for, so it does not. So just as a, um, as a point of understanding, the SIP message is used separately from register. It's not required. All right, so the advantage of using SIP is basically in all of these situations, whether you've got a phone that's hanging off of a switch on the same flat network that your asterisk box is, or maybe it's through a router, or maybe it's out in the internet somewhere. In each one of these cases, the same protocol is being used for the later SIP register and the SIP invites um, for the phone calls, as well as the configuration. So DPMA just works because you're using a path for SIP messaging that you're already setting up in order to allow the phone to make calls through uh, to the asterisk server. So um, you can take a phone home. You can have a phone that's on your desk at work, and you can take it home and plug it into your connection at, at, uh, at home. And as long as it's able to make a connection back to that same server, if it's on a public IP address, or you've gone to the extra step of configuring a separate network entry in MDN, in, um, resdigiumphone.conf to tell it, hey, when you're outside of the, um, the company network, you need to use these other settings to get in through the firewall. Um, basically, it will still work. It'll still try to talk to the same server. It'll still connect. Um, the, also, in, a, in addition to, of course, um, using the same, same server that it talked to last, uh, DHCP option 66, uh, will allow, if, if you uh, have that in the network that you've got the phone in, you can cause the phone to reach the server that way. Or it's also possible on the phone itself at any point, if it comes up and can't find the server, you can manually put the IP address and the port uh, into the phone at any time. Uh, so this really brings the question is if we're running configuration across the internet, is this secure? And the answer is yes, because DPMA encrypts with SSL the entire communication of that configuration file uh, through the SIP messages. So the SIP message headers are readable. The SIP message body, where the text of the um, configuration file is transmitted, is not. That's SSL encrypted. So between the DPMA module and the phone is an encrypted SSL connection across SIP message that allows us to never transmit a password in plain text. That means that the configuration file, which includes that much sought after by a hacker, IP address, username, and password in order to make calls through your system is not in the clear. They will not be able to, yes. Yes, this is, yeah, so this, what I'm talking about, uh, we have enabled TCP and TLS transport, but this is the fact even when you're using UDP as a transport. So you can sniff all those packets all you want, they are encrypted. Question in the back? Uh, I don't think the phone has a phone. I'm sorry, the phones? Uh, we have, the older models do not do TLS. The 60s do. Yeah, do yeah they work on configuration, I've done it. 
And the old phones do work in TCP, but um, according to Malcolm, they, they, they have problems with TLS right now, uh, which is something I'm expecting us to uh, will, will fix or somehow uh, prevent, provide a nice message saying, I'm sorry, I can't do that, uh, if it's just not possible for them because of the uh, older model. Uh, but basically, yes, you can configure the, um, the, the phone. That connection is encrypted even over UDP. So the UDP is re readable. The UDP message itself is readable. But the body of the UDP SIP message is SSL encrypted. So the configuration file will never be visible. Uh, so that brings up another question. OK, it's, is this really safe to use across the internet? I mean, we're talking hackers here. <laughs> uh, there is a caveat here uh, saying yes, but it is necessary for you to take the small precaution of let's not allow somebody to get the configuration without some kind of security code, without some kind of password. It is possible to configure DPMA in a default mode of, hey, if anybody asks, give them a list of users. If anybody picks one of those users, go ahead and give them a configuration. Uh, now, if you're doing this with an open port to the internet, you're asking for trouble. Of course, they'd have to have a Digium phone, but still, not a good idea. Uh, so my recommendation for best security practices are make sure that you have an authorization code with at least six digits. This is a good idea even if you're not exposing the DPMA SIP messages to the outside internet. Um, because honestly, you're going to have somebody in a big business that's going to try to wreak havoc <laughs> or do something accidentally even. And without that pin code, they can't assign, reassign a phone. Uh, do not port forward uh, or otherwise allow incoming SIP messages from unknown IP addresses into your asterisk server if you don't need to. There's no sense in giving a ha hackers a pathway into your box. I mean, these are just common sense for SIP anyway. If you do absolutely positively need to have random phones showing up from any IP address and connecting up to your SIP, um, at least for the Digium phones, consider the possibility that you could limit the SIP configuration of Digium phones to a separate port that is not exposed to the outside world. Um, it would not prevent a phone from being taken home and used with a SIP register. It just wouldn't be able to pull, a di pull new configuration through DPMA. All right, uh, re quick review of the initial configuration of a uh, phone. And by initial, I mean out of box experience here. Phone's empty, has never seen a, a server, boots up, scans the MDNS to see, hey, who's out there? Uh, gets a list of what services it finds in MDNS. If it has an option 66 entry, it will show that as well. So right off the bat, if you have a server on your network, it's going to pick that. If there's more than one option, it's going to stop and wait for somebody to tell it which one it should use. So if you've got option 66 or an MDNS entry telling the phone, hey, this is your asterisk server, the phone will go ahead and use it uh, or ask you which one you want to use. Um, the um, after the user has selected the uh, server, there's also an optional, I'm sorry, I skipped this. Uh, it's possible to set the user list to require a pin code. In other words, I don't want to expose my list of users to somebody driving by. Um, it's possible to require that same pin code for getting the user list. So even if you don't, if, um, if you don't have the administrator pin code, you can't even get the list of users. Um, the, after the, Phone has gotten the list of users. Uh, it sh uh, shows the, or rather, phones list of extensions. It shows that list on the screen, allows the uh, user to pick it. An alternative version of that is that it is possible, much like the normal Polycom or other phone TFTP configuration option, where you pre-configure the MAC address. It's also possible with DPMA to say. I'd rather just hard code this MAC address as that extension, period, end of story. And, and, and there's no more discussion about it, and no need to pick which user. If you've set up that mode, then um, it goes straight to that user, obviously. Uh, once the user selects the extension, again, with an optional um, entry of the uh, administrator's PIN code, or for uh, once you've selected the user, 
you could be using instead the user's PIN code instead of the administrator's PIN code. That way, an individual can assign a phone to themselves. They can't assign somebody else's phone to them. Um, then the phone will download the configuration file uh, for that extension, and it will reboot if need be, and connect up the asterisk and be a phone, just like that. Uh, two phones, one extension. <laughs> Uh, this is a common problem. Obviously, ChanSIP cannot have more than one device registered to the same SIP URI because the last one to send the register is the one it's going to send the call to. It has only one place to store it. Now, ChanPJSIP doesn't have that problem, but with DPMA, we're talking about another level of abstraction. Lines equals uh, endpoints in the ChanSIP or ChanPJSIP configuration. But phones or phone users in DPMA really is equating to a MAC address. So for a specific phone, you need to have one configuration per MAC address, which means you can't take the same configuration file and assign it to two phones. What happens when you try is that DPMA very smartly says to the original phone, hey, um, you just lost your configuration. Go back and ask for configuration again, at which point it will stop and at, the, um, uh, at a user prompt saying, hey, um, I can't get my configuration right now. Do you want to re retry or do you want to try to go get something else back from the server again or pick a different server? So you have options at that point. Uh, but basically, because DPMA is configuring a phone, we're, we're really depending on um, there being a correlation between a specific phone's MAC address and a specific ResDigium phone, phone configuration. Um, now, if you have two line buttons on your phone and the second line button is configured with the same line extension as another PJ SIP U, uh, endpoint, that's fine as long as you are properly handling the PJSIP dial contacts in the dial plan in order to ring both lines, ring both uh, connections, rather. Uh, that is supported in PJSIP, and it is possible to configure the same lines to multiple phones. Uh, what can DPMA configure? Well, basically everything that the phone can be, uh, can, that the, um, all of the options on the phone, almost all the options on the phone, can be set through DPMA. That includes what lines are on what line buttons, uh, line being an endpoint. Uh, external lines, you can tell a phone that it is going to connect to this other secondary asterisk box somewhere else. Uh, multiple networks, so that when it goes to a different environment, it auto recognizes that it needs to talk to this other port in order to get to the firewall. Uh, list of contacts, logos for the, for the phone screens, ringtone files, alert settings. Uh, which is your uh, different ringtones based on what the alert message is in the SIP header. Uh, phone applications, the phone support, if you weren't aware. Uh, custom JavaScript, you can write your own JavaScript applications and load them into the phone through DPMA. Uh, phone firmware updates are automatically loaded into the phone when it restarts if you've got that configured. Uh, phone settings such as volume display, time zone, whole, slew, whole list of things that can also be set through DPMA. Uh, we have new configuration options. These things are um, just released in the new DPMA uh, 3.1 or 3.2. 3.2 just came out. Uh, multicast paging is now supported across all the models with the latest firmware. Uh, that allows you to do uh, just like, it, it, like what it sounds like, uh, sending one stream out of Asterix and having all the phones within the multicast uh, network range. Uh, go off and off, um, uh, go into the speaker phone mode and play that audio, just like it was an individual page without burning all of the calls. TCP transport is supported with the old phones, uh, supports configuring DPMA over TCP. The TLS support is only for the new phone, new D6 phones currently. Uh, secure media with SRTP, again, only a new uh, D6X phone support. Um, 8021X support is limited on the old models. Uh, all of the modules, all the methods that we support are supported on the D6X. Um, only EAP, MD5, and the base pass-through and auto log off are supported on the uh, original uh, models. 
Uh, how do we con create the configuration? Well, that big long list of Resdigium phone options is basically um, parsed through by DPMA in order to build a even bigger, uglier <laughs> look looking XML file that is downloaded to the phone with all kinds of configuration information, uh, which is actually relatively complicated, but there is a wiki page on it if you ever wanted to get into that. It is possible, although seldom used, to tell DPMA that, hey, I have my own XML configuration file. Here it is. Just use that. So if you're comfortable with configuring the phone directly with XML or for some reason there's some feature you're trying to make use of that that's the only way to do it because the Resdigium phone conf format doesn't support it, it is possible to bypass that and go ahead and just supply your own XML file. DPMA requirements. All right. Uh, DPMA was first released with asterisk 1.8.11 1 1 cert uh, 11. Okay. Uh, the last 1.8.11 DPMA version that was produced was 2.3. 2.2 is actually, if you look at the last line, the requirement for a 2.0 firmware phone. Prior to 2.2, there was a change in the DPMA protocol, and a 2.1 or earlier version of DPMA will actually end up crashing asterisks if you've already upgraded your phone to firmware 2.0 or later. Uh, DPMA is not compatible with CentOS prior to 6.0. 5.0 CentOS, 5-anything uh, CentOS, doesn't have the necessary glibcs for DPMA to work. Uh, where PJSIP is being used, uh, it's required that it's at least version 2.3. Uh, Asterix versions 11, 13, and 14 are actively supported. 11 is about to go into bug support only, but it will continue to be supported um, until the uh, next cutoff date for 11 with DPMA. So new features will continue to come out for Asterix 11 for a little while. And Asterix 14 just out already has a DPMA module built for it. DPMA requires Ava Hot which Avahi, which is the Linux name for the MDNS library. And again, firmware 2.0 requires uh, DPMA 2.2 or later. If you've got a 3.0 DPMA, you're fine. Uh, installing DPMA in Asterix, the process is not terribly difficult, but does require some command line Linux. You have to download the Asterix version. I've got the link. Uh, there's also a web page that shows you uh, how to find the right version. Extract the tarball, very important step, shut down asterisk. If you copy the resdigiumphone.so module, or any module, over the top of one that exists, you are most likely going to end up with a crash of asterisk. That's because all of a sudden the symbols and, and um, uh, pointers, the positions of things changed for something it, we thought it had in memory. Uh, for 32-bit, just copy the SO, the two SO modules, uh, Residigium Phone and the Endpoint Identifier into uh, the Asterix Modules directory for a 64-bit CentOS, of course. Anybody familiar with that knows you have to use the lib64 path. And then you can restart Asterix and you've got the new version. Uh, the Endpoint Identifier DPMA.SO module is required for PJSIP support. All of the PJSIP connectivity is in that module. And it will not actually load, don't be concerned, if you do not have PJSIP installed in Asterix. So for Asterix 11, you don't even have that module. In Asterix 13, without PJSIP being installed, you will find that that module will not load. That's fine. Uh, installing DPMA with free PBX. Um, DPMA is already installed in the free PBX distro if you download it today. However, at any point, you may need to update it in order to get to something. Uh, if you're on 3.0, you've got pretty good uh, version, pretty recent version. Uh, if you wanted to go ahead and get the 3.2 version in order to try out TCP or TLS support, you would need to update that. Uh, in order to get to the latest that the free PBX install, the distro has, go ahead and run a yum update of the, um, of the module from their repository. They, uh, we'll probably have the 3.2 fairly soon. Uh, and if you wanted to go ahead and get the most latest, go ahead and use the same process here to go down and, and uh, download the uh, tarball of the specific version you want and install it. Make sure you use the FW console stop uh, command in FreePBX to stop asterisks first. 
uh, licensing DPMA. It is required to get a license for DPMA to function. It is a free license. It's available for free on the store. You only need a Digium account uh, to get that uh, li license code to download. It's a zero cost license. Uh, in free PBX, it's super easy. Just put it in on the GUI where it prompts you to, um, and then it will be registered. For Asterix, uh, for doing it without free PBX, it's slightly more complicated. You have to download the register utility. Uh, if anybody's ever installed the, uh, the, res the uh, Asterix fax or any of the other commercial modules of the G729, the same process. Um, and of course, you do need internet connection on the computer you're running the register command on uh, to get the license to succeed installing. Uh, CLI commands for Digium, I mean for uh, Digium phones, for the DPMA. Uh, you can check the status. You can show what version of, of um, Digium phones is installed. You can check the settings, which is, you know, what are the global settings. Um, you can show tokens. Tokens is what phones have been configured. It'll give you a URL list of the phones that are connected. Sessions is phones that have talked to DPMA but don't have an active configuration. Uh, that's the only difference between those two commands. As a whole lot of other status information you can get as well. And these commands allow you to actually make changes. Um, module reload is, hey, I've made several changes to asterisks. I need to reload everything. Uh, module reload resdigiumphone.so says, I've made a change to resdigiumphone.conf, I need you to reload it. Now, a caveat here is that because DPMA reads configuration information from other places in Asterix, specifically voicemail and the PJSIP or SIP configuration, if you've made a change to something else that would affect an endpoint, make sure you do a module reload so that all configuration is loaded. Uh, for P for um, free PBX, of course, once you've hit the apply button, that's done for you automatically. Uh, if you wanted to cause all the phones to reconfigure, you've updated the firmware, or you put new logos on the screens, or whatever, you can send a single command to get them all to reconfigure. It'll send a reconfigure message to every phone with a configuration token um, that's on the tokens list. Uh, reconfigure phone and a specific number allows you to identify one specific phone that I want to reconfigure. And all it's doing is very similar to the SIP notify that you would use with conventional IP phones. It's sending a message out to the phone that says, hey, your configuration file has probably changed. Would you please go download a new version? Uh, demonstration time. Okay. So let's bring up a phone. Whoops. There we go. Let's bring up a phone that I have on, actually I need to do one thing first, which is bring up 10.9. I've got an instance of, uh, of uh, free PBX installed in this machine. Oops, I think I do, hang on. That down here where I can see what I'm doing. That should have worked. <laughs> Maybe a short-lived demonstration if I can't get in touch with the machine. All right, what's going on here? Yeah, 1099, that should have worked. Uh, while we're waiting on that to load, apparently something went to sleep on me. Uh, is there any questions I can answer? Yes, in the back. The, uh, and I'll repeat the question, so, but do speak up. Is there any way to prevent all the notifications that come from the DPMA to the DPMA? Boom, then all the registrations and all the presence of the DPMA the there is, and I'm glad you brought that up because it is something I did not put on the presentation. Um, in, I believe, DPMA version 2.3, uh, but don't hold me to that, a change was made to create a separate logging channel for DPMA. Basically, in logger.conf, you can go in and say, in fact, you have to or you won't see them. You can go in and say DPMA equals arrow DPMA. And what you'll end up with then is a 
DPMA file in var log asterisk with all of and only the DPMA entries in it. So you can now isolate all of the DPMA uh, log entries into that one uh, log file. Oh, we did finally get this to come up. All right. Except that it didn't drag. <laughs> Here we go. All right, so we've got a, um, we've got a free PBX system, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you real quick the under connectivity, the web interface for Digium phones. And I have this phone already configured. I've also got the system in what we call non-easy mode. There's an easy mode and a non-easy mode. Let me show you the difference real quick. If I enable easy mode and save that, all of a sudden my configuration information becomes a whole lot simpler and there's much less that I need to worry about. At, in easy mode, basically there's a one-to-one -one correlation between you create an extension in FreePBX and there's a configuration entry automatically generated in uh, res, in the uh, Digium Phones entry for the Res Digium Phone DPMA module uh, to configure from. So if I was to add an extension, for example, uh, I don't know why I can never find extensions when I'm looking for it. There's so many things on that list. <laughs> so if I do a, a quick create extension and I say I want a Chan PJ SIP extension and it's 201, and a uh, food bar. There you go. <laughs> and I save that. Where'd my mouse go? There it is. Uh, and I don't really care about any of the other settings because I just want to create a phone. And I apply that. I go back to connectivity Digium phones. I now have a 201 phone. Okay, great. So let's see how that works. If I go back to my phone screen here and I tell it using the front panel menu here that I want to reconfigure it. Uh, let's see, five, reconfigure. So I'm saying, um, yes, I had a configuration, but I want to start over. This would be the same as if I had taken it out of the box from scratch. Uh, when you tell a phone to reconfigure, it's basically erasing. Um, uh, it's not quite a factory reset, and there is a fact separate factory reset option, but it is going back and uh, reconfiguring um, from scratch. Uh, free PBX demo is what I have called that machine, and it automatically selected it because that was the only available entry. Uh, foobar extension 201, it came up, I just created that. So now I hit the check, check key and say select that and it will load it. Now you'll notice I've got transport TCP I'm using here uh, to configure this phone. So it's actually using a TCP connection instead of UDP, which uh, is slightly faster as I have turned out, as I've, I've, I've noticed. And boom, there I've got a phone configured with 201. That easy, yes. Sangoma's Endpoint Manager is using the option 66 to a non-SIP configuration method. So that would be an HTTP, uh, probably HTTPS, I would imagine they're using. Uh, at least I would hope so. Okay, uh, the Digium phones do not support TFTP, so it would probably be the HTTP or HTTPS option. Since they already have a web server, it's easy enough to do. Um, there's a couple of extra additional features that you get baked in with uh, DPMA, such as visual voicemail. Fe features that are um, built into the phone as an application that have components inside DPMA that are answering those service requests, such as to get the list of voicemails and bring them up on the screen of the phone. Uh, those are things that are specifically um, handled by DPMA. 
above and beyond what, um, I mean, so there, there is an advantage to using our configuration method with our phones. Um, let me do a quick change and demonstrate how uh, easy it is to say load a logo onto the phone. If I can get my key, keys to work on my keyboard. <laughs> so uh, if I go into, oh, I'm already here. So I go back to general settings, and let me show you real quick where that name was. Under advanced on general settings, I can set the name of the server here. It defaults to asterisks, which is usually descriptive enough, but of course when we're testing, we've got a dozen different machines spun up on the same network, and it can be very confusing who's is who's very quickly. So um, very commonly we'll change that to identify which machine it is. Uh, this feature is new that allows you to set how it's going to tell the phone to connect to DPMA. Uh, UDP is the old standard. Uh, it still works just fine. Uh, TCP is um, a little faster. Now to do TCP, I separately have to go into the free PBX SIP configuration for the PJ SIP channel driver and tell it to enable TCP. If I've not enabled TCP, telling it to use TCP on, DM, on uh, uh, DPMA, of course, is not gonna work. The transport has to be active for it to function. Uh, if I turn the easy mode off, so now I have full editing control on the phones, and I go back to the phones list, and I edit this 201 phone, and I come down here, and I forgot to set up a logo first. So I'm going to add a logo for Astrocon. Oh, I already did that. <laughs> for Tuesday. And I'm going to say it's for a D65, so I get the right dimensions. And I'm going to choose a file. And I've got a file in pictures. That's the Astrocon logo. And I'm going to upload that. And that's what I'm going to select for the phone. So I go back to phones, edit my 201 phone, come down here to, oops, too far to available logos, I'm gonna take the Tuesday logo and I'm gonna put it on the 201 phone and save. And you always gotta remember then, hit your apply config. And now what I can do is tell this phone to reconfigure. And what happens is it says configuration updating and boom. I have the Astrocon logo. And interestingly enough, um, it's also, since it's regenerated the contacts XML, added my other extension as a contact as well. Yes? Does support I believe we are looking at supporting OpenVPN, but I do not 100% know the answer to that question right at the top of my head. It's, it's one of those cases that, um, I, as a, um, as a phone feature, that's a question that Malcolm would have to answer. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've, we've been looking at that. I do not know what the status of it is. Um, and um, uh, I, of course, once it is an available feature on the phone, of course, we'll put the configuration options into free PBX, into the DPMA configuration tool. And any integration that we can make that work better with free PBX, of course, we will do. Um, because when the first generated the uh, configuration, the context file hadn't been generated yet. Uh, no, that's a, th sorry. Um, 201 is my phone itself. Um, the second button is me trying to call 200. It's a BLF button. It automatically added the other contacts on the system as BLF buttons. Yeah, it's, it's slightly differentiated on the display. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yes, they are hard buttons and they do light up. If I had a second phone, I could make it go off hook and <laughs> ring and everything and you'd see light up. Uh, any other questions? We are at 11.55. I got five minutes <laughs> and then it's lunchtime. Actually, no, uh, wrong talk. I'm thinking Thursday. Uh, <laughs> I already had lunch. <laughs> Dinner time. Yeah, that, yes. It's end of day. Questions, please. Sorry? There is a lot of questions, but maybe you should find the, the, the examples for us on the website. So. Okay. Yes. The, uh, the lightning is free. I'm yes. curious what the rationale was for requiring devices that they charge for the download. Um, I think that's more of a marketing thing to see how much usage the module has. Um, we have a lot of modules that we provide in a binary form only for one reason or another that because we have put all this extra time and effort into building that module we also want to know what the usage level is. Uh, in this case it is not a phone home system it is a one-time oh well thanks for letting me know <laughs> Uh, it is a one-time, apparently the camera crashed. Uh, it is a one-time registration. So really, it's really just a measure of intent to at least test it. Um, and as many licenses as I burn through testing things, I mean, I don't, obviously they know it's me because I put my name on it. But um, I'm probably one of the highest usage of <laughs> DPMA because <laughs> I tend to go through several of them a, a day sometimes. <laughs> Any other questions? I apologize, I don't know the exact details on phone features, uh, but certainly we can get uh, you in touch with somebody that can answer those questions specifically. Yeah. Yes? Uh, in three minutes, they can go through the Pentium booth and I'm sure somebody can answer those Yes, questions. that would be great. So, uh, oh, the expo hall opens. That's what's happening. Wonderful. I am looking forward to seeing that. All right. Completely separate question, is everyone enjoying Astrocon? Yay, all right. Uh, I know I have enjoyed coming here every year. This is my first time giving a talk. Uh, it's fortunate that it's on a subject that I actually know something about. <laughs> um, and I, of course, have enjoyed it every year I've come. This is the fourth Astrocon in a row I've been to. I've, I've, I got hired up in early September three years ago, and the first thing they did was ship me off to Astrocon. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've been looking forward to doing it for years. I've been wanting to come to Astrocon for, for years and years and never could afford to, and had to, had to join the company to do it. <laughs> but um, I know it's a, a wonderful opportunity for developers and business people alike that use this great product to come and and really connect and, and be able to do really cool things with, with asterisks that you wouldn't otherwise know about. And I hope I've been able to at least answer a few questions and provide a couple of ideas of, of you know, things that can be done with our phones. Well, thank you very much for attending my talk. <laughs>